Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. Here are the readings for the 15th Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on September 10th, 2023. The first reading is uh, Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 7 through 11. Uh, our continuous reading uh, in Exodus is chapter 12, verses 1 through 14. The psalm is the 119th, that long psalm. And we're reading verses 33 through 40 this week. The epistle reading is the 13th chapter of Romans, verses 8 through 14. And our gospel is Matthew 18, verses 15 through 20. And I... You know, we're moving into this section of of Matthew that really is about this, you know, what does living together look like? And some of the, mm -hmm. and particularly, you know, next week we'll, uh, we'll be talking about forgiveness and then, uh, and then the steps toward uh, some kind of reconciliation here. I, I know I've talked about this before, and I think I've written it in a, a Dear Working Preacher column in the past, but I... I I'm just going to say it again, that with all of this, when you think about the, you know, preacher engaging this and thinking, well, that's, that's so-and-so and so-and-so in my church and, you know, all of these, I mean, they can probably put names. You can probably, y'all can put names to all the things that are happening in these texts or the people that I, you know, or I, who I need to forgive and, and those kinds of things. Um, and and the you know these real realities of what does it mean to be a community of faith and and when did that when does that when does the community of faith really start to uh, devolve into uh, really sad and hurtful practices and kind of forgetting who who you are and so that's why I I always when I come to these passages in Matthew gravitate to verse twenty that where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. And we often uh, approach that, rightly so, we hear that passage as, oh, here we are gathered, Jesus is among us, that's lovely. You know, the promise of, of Jesus' presence in the, in the assembly, uh, even in the small assembly of two or three, there is Jesus, and 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 there's, and that's a, a, it's a lovely image and it's a lovely promise. It takes on a little but, bit. Of, what? <laughs> we, hear it. But, <laughs> we hear it. But it takes on a little bit of a different meaning if that gathering is uh, it is a place of conflict or a place that's in a, a situation where reconciliation is needed or forgiveness is needed or where there's tension, right? And so I wonder how often we think about Jesus being present in those moments when we're trying to work toward reconciliation or forgiveness or to mend a relationship. Or would we really say what we want to say in that moment? Were we to imagine Jesus sitting right there at that table at a council meeting or, or you know, a staff meeting or whatever? And if Jesus is really sitting there, is that what you're going to say to your fellow, you know, your, your fellow staff person? Is that what you're going to say to the secretary of the council or whatever, or your board? I. Uh, that's, it just takes on a different, it, that's an absolutely essential piece to this, all of this week and next week is that we, yeah, that there is a, there's that promise, but it's also, it calls us to a kind of navigating this and negotiating this from a, a place of faith and love. And um, Jesus is, Jesus is watching. I think in a, it's really important. Yes. I, I think another essential piece of understanding this is the context and the previous 14 verses that have all been about concern for the vulnerable in a community. And that's, forgive the siren if you can hear that in my microphone here. But uh, the so the point of what's going on in verses 15 through 20 isn't about being right or even necessarily 
pulling in somebody who's causing trouble from time to time, or that might be part of it, but it's really what has to happen in the community that, that does care for the most vulnerable among it um, and how conflict or how dissension or just, and sometimes just pure bad faith acting from some people uh, is more than just, inconvenient for the leaders, it actually is putting a stumbling block in front of the faith of others. And that's the fun job of the of the, the leader, right, is to do what has to be done to protect those who need that kind of protection, whether it's physical or spiritual or whatever. And you, we've had a lot of discussions, not here among us on the podcast, but externally about, you know, where is the church? Uh, where, 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 where is the community? And sometimes it's not when we gather on Sunday, but it's where we gather Monday through Saturday. And so every time I read this text in, you know, the last, I don't know, what is it, 15, 20 years, whenever Facebook came out and we started gathering in these virtual communities, um, I, w- I want to, I want to bring your words, Caroline, to that community and, and, and your recognition, Matt, of the vulnerable, um, not necessarily the people we aim our Facebook posts to, but the people who are scrolling and seeing that we're doing it in the name of our, you know, the Christian quote or biblical text that we had above it or that will come after it or the invitation to worship with us or, or something. And then in between that is clearly something that's more of an attack of someone that if you follow the thread doesn't suggest that you've even gone to that person, that you followed this math, Matthew step at all. And um, we have we have talked on the podcast in terms of how our actions um speak louder than our words and how we are to live out these practices of hospitality and and unity. Um, I wonder if we should do that in our virtual communities too. And if we should think that if this is going to be our space, if this is going to be where we put forth our witness, then maybe we should use our words as if Jesus is reading first. Jesus is reading. Just, Jesus is watching. Jesus is watching. Jesus is reading. And and did Jesus edit this text? <laughs> what were you going to say? I'll just say? I'll just say to our listeners, I'm not reading your theological hot takes on social media. I'm just there for your dog photos. <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> just, just show me your dog. Thank you for that, Matt. Yeah, I I find myself much more willing to go to Facebook for the puppies. And yeah, the I'm kitties. skipping over a whole lot of the theology that people the think are out there. And the kitties, I like but the I like the doggies. I like the kitties and I like the dogs. Somehow, I'm not quite sure how this happened, but I now, I signed up for like following a pug Twitter page. And so uh, on a daily basis, several times a day, I get these notifications that, I don't know, with gotta love pugs or something like that has tweeted another pug doing something absolutely adorable because that's what pugs are, are absolutely adorable. So anyway, that's- Pug pug aficionado or something like that. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Something like that. So- Oh, scruffy. Should we, move, should we move to Ezekiel? <laughs> yeah, let's let's do that. Let's yeah. do that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, on on a more sober so sober note, um, yeah. a, a young woman uh, that I I met, um, uh, I guess about a year ago, um, posted um, a few weeks ago a um, a um, a video that made a line that. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, and um, what she basically said, well, I should point out that I'm, I'm looking at a verse 11 um, where it says, as I live, says the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but 
that the wicked turn from their ways and live. And, and what this what this young woman said was that they didn't believe in a God who would send people to hell. And I know a lot of people um, th- that a lot of people articulate that, but some things had happened in her life that caused her to say, "But we sure do turn in that direction and run away from God." And I her her video is just stuck in my mind as I read verse this this verse eleven because that's the God that I believe in, a God that that has no pleasure in the death of anyone, including the wicked. But I also know that as we do what the commentator calls a whiplash between uh, judgment and grace, um, that there are some folks that seem to keep turning away from God's good and God's hospitality and God's concern for the marginalized and 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 keep oppressing. And in, in that, using the words of this young woman, we keep turning away from God and running in the other direction. I, it's a sober note um, uh, for a sober passage in, in Ezekiel. It's, um, I mean, the whole notion of like conflict and correction and all of that, again, plays into, whether it's here or in the Matthew text, plays into a lot of people's worst experiences in churches and in religion, right? Who, yeah, yeah. Who have found those communities to be uh, oppressive in some way or, and, or at best just too nosy. Um, so it's hard to reread these texts in a different way. But I think what you're getting at, Joy, is really important that it's, Reminds you of the Deuteronomy text, right? I've set before you two ways: one leads to death, one leads to life. Uh, choose life. So, how how does the the corrective work of the community of faith do so in a way that says, you know, <laughs> look what you're missing, look what you're passing up here? I mean, how and how do we bring that into conflict when it's not even necessarily true that one person's right, and one person's wrong, you know? But it's just this kind of what kind of community do you want to be? Do we really want to keep arguing like the people argue on TV? You know, do we really want to um, be a place where we have to talk about certain topics in hushed voices? So it's that question of like what leads to life and yeah. how does that play itself out in community dynamics? I'm not sure I've ever seen that done very well. I certainly have seen it done poorly, but that's that's part of the challenge. Um, what kind of community can do this well? And that's, well, and that's, I, this is where the Psalm 119, uh, I would bring in this portion of this Psalm in that regard. I mean, how, how do we do this? And we, in part, we have to implore God or appeal to God and say, teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes. Uh, give me understanding that I might keep your law. Lead me in the path of your commandments. Because it's it's these ways of the Lord, these uh, these ordinances, these precepts, these the, you know the word of the Lord that does bring life. Mm-hmm. But we have to. It's clear <laughs> that we have we have to pray that, and we have to remind ourselves of that on a really really frequent basis, and and it goes back to you know the 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 presence of Jesus in our midst. But but to in those moments, maybe one thing is to stop and say, all right, <laughs> let's all pray Psalm one nineteen. We're yes. going to stop in the middle of this. And we're going to all pray one night, Psalm, the Psalm 19, 119, 33 to 40. All right. Now we'll go back to what we were doing. Right. <laughs> it's just like, we just need these constant reminders of, of, of what kind of community we are called to be. And, and what, and, and like you said, um, Matt, that so much of what people's experiences, unfortunately, of church and church institutions extensions of the church, institutions of the church, uh, arms arms of the church are the worst when it comes to demonstrating living out God's God's principles and and 
and making decisions that lead to life and joy and delight and as the psalmist says and so and and um and goodness <laughs> so that's my that's my thought you like stop time out everybody needs a time out and we're yeah. going to read yeah. we're going to read Psalm 19 <laughs> You know, the, the the Ezekiel passage in 33 is has always been, um, I, I was taught that as a child, um, you know, the, the task that we have to give a warning. Um, and I want to, I, I, that, that's a part of my call. So I, I want to do that. But I want to do that with the hospitality and the grace. And if if it's okay to move to the Exodus passage, yeah. Um, yeah. as I was reading this time with that, you know, first of all, the echo of of, of this young young woman's statement about how we make the turn, um, and this desire that we've been talking about of the hospitality and and peace that the gospel is calling us to, I paid attention to verse four in Exodus 12. And and let me read it and put it in context, see if you can hear it. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it should join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat of it. Now, I love celebrations. I love the fact that this is the beginning of a marking of where God has shown up and shown out and they're going to keep rehearsing it. But whenever I've been tuned into these texts, it's always been about the, 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 the lamb without spot or blemish. It's always been about making the perfect offering before God. And in verse four, I read that as a single person who's an only child and love it when somebody says, I'm over for a holiday because then I'm not eating one portion of, you know, uh, of, 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 of ribs, but I'm actually in a room where the table is spread. And that's what this is about. How is it that we've missed the hospitality and the friendliness in this particular text and focus instead on the fault lines? I, I I just wonder if we might, in our theme where we're talking about, and we'll get to this again when we go back to Romans, what is Paul looking for? He's looking for hospitality, peace, and unity, that that has always been God's concern. And so lifting up verse four, which says, when you spread a table, include the person whose family might be smaller so that they can feast at a banquet. Oh, isn't that the promise of how time as we know it is going to end when Christ returns? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Like that. One thought I had looking at over this text is, um, you know, again, this is the problem with the, or the challenge with the, the semi-continuous reading is so much time <laughs> has elapsed. So much takes place. Yeah. And you don't want to spend your entire sermon just summarizing the whole book of Exodus, but I think the preacher needs to go back and look at, because, you know, there's a, a violent scene's about to take place, and this mm -hmm. is a ritual that's that's both a, a beautiful display of salvation and, and horrific all at the same time. But I think you have to remember, you know, God hearing the cries of God's children in Egypt for generations and generations, the oppression that was there we, the last week's text had some mention of that, that Pharaoh is trying to literally thin the population of mm -hmm. Hebrews um, because they're getting too, too numerous. Um, and they do that through just backbreaking, soul crushing, deadly work. Pharaoh has been given so many opportunities to do the right thing and seen displays of God's power and has not just refused, but kind of stood up as this alternate God. Right. And so, I mean, there's, the conflict has been growing and building and it's more than just a political decision. It's more than just about Pharaoh versus Moses. There's a, there's a, there's a theological um, conflict that's playing itself out here. And so how you, how you capture that 
Because without that, I think you also miss the way in which this is such a grand story of liberation that's just really becomes the story that so much of, of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, looks back on as a time when God chose God's people, when God made a clear statement about slavery and servitude, when God made a clear statement about the idolatry of Pharaoh and his, 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 um, his arrogance, how we impress that to, to kind of get the full spectacle. I mean that in the best possible use of that word of this passage and what's going to come next week. And in light of Ezekiel, this whole idea of the patience of God, Matt, you mentioned that there's this long waiting that the, the, the children have been crying out for a long time. Um, so before God destroys, God has been patient with the wickedness. Before God, you know, uh, does this, we talked a, a few weeks ago about the 1159 timing of God. You know, God's always at the very last minute. Um, but it's a patience because it is not God's desire that even the wicked would perish. Um, and, and, and in that goodness of God, set up what this spectacle is about to be. I really appreciate that. Really appreciate that, 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 Matt. Um, I think there's also an invitation here to, not that I would want a whole sermon to be on this, but an invitation into the, the meaning and function of, of festivals and rituals. Mm -hmm. And though, and because, you know, this is one of the major, of course, this is a pilgrimage feast for, Jesus and the Jew and the and the Jews and and uh, and and how is it that these these moments or these celebrations these festivals what are they calling to mind why do we do them and uh, and I think any time we can maybe particular I, I I don't know if I want this to be a teaching sermon but it could also be a moment where where we where we do say a little bit more about what Passover means, um, because you know Jesus is a is a an observant Jew and is in Jerusalem for Passover, yes. and uh, and like in John, he's the Passover Lamb, and so these moments where we have a, a, a glimpse into that that as you were talking about Matt, the wider reality of what this is claiming about God, and this is not just a you know, we can't really pass over those moments when we're reading scripture or, you know, when it's the, it, so the Passover of Jews was near, we can't just like, oh, that's just something that they did. I mean, it's, it's meaningful. It's important. And so that's, that, that would be a very different kind of sermon, but it might be one that your congregation would be helped by. Absolutely. Absolutely. Romans. I, Usually I hear Romans 13 and I get scared, but it's not those verses. So <laughs> I, the, I mean, this, it kind of relates to what we've been talking about in terms of, this is the connection I was making that in terms of what is observable mm -hmm. about us as Christians, mm -hmm. as followers of God's ordinances, as ones that imagine you know Jesus at the table and that that and and we and ones that pray teach me your ways O lord and here we have another way to think about that with the metaphor of putting on the lord jesus christ uh, or another way you can translate that is to be clothed right it's that what is that observable? What are you wearing <laughs> that uh, that is that your 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 outward appearance right is communicating and and communicating that loyalty and that um, the way of love and life and so um, I I that could be for me a whole sermon in terms of using that really really kind of exploring that me that metaphor imaginatively of being clothed what are you wearing um what do you you know put to put on and imagine you know putting on jesus every day 
All right. You, you got the question point. wrong. What? It's not what are you wearing? It's who are you wearing? Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. They ask you at the red carpet, right? Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, exactly. Who are you wearing? Wearing? Who are you say Versace. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and and the, nobody, the, ever, nobody ever asks me who am I wearing? That's who are you wearing? <laughs> I don't have any of those in my closet, those kinds of gowns in my closet. Those, those but, kinds of gowns. Yeah. But, but, but yeah, that could be that. a great title, right? Who, who are you are wearing? You wearing? I love it. Yeah. 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 And anyway, I, that's I, right. Yeah. For and I and I and I love the fact that once again, um, Paul is being incredibly Jewish, um, because um, there's this recognition that, that that is stated clearly in verse ten: "Love does no wrong to a neighbor." Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. It's a reinterpretation that reminds us that this aim that Paul is setting forth in this whole letter of in, a, in, a, in the midst of discord and disunity, he's calling for unity and peace. And it's not a new thing. It's not even something that he came up with because he encountered Jesus. It's something he understood that has always been the intention of God. And that is how we treat the other is the fulfilling of the law. And once again, I'll say it, that's good news. <laughs>